You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Wednesday. August 24th, 2016. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the four-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal, the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Baz Dreisinger, professor, journalist, author, of Incarceration Nations. And for members, a Matt Peck, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because we're on vacation. Yet, we still bring you all new content. Now, I know Matt is somewhere right now. I, I know what I'm doing right now. I am, let's see, it's 12 noon on uh, on Wednesday. <sighs> I'm begging Saul to please just take a nap because last night you stayed up so late. Now you're tired. Let's just do this. Uh, we're probably at the beach. He probably has a rash. Milo's complaining because Saul is hitting. What? You're at the beach? I think we could be at the beach. Nice. I'm imagining it. Very nice. It's probably raining. It's probably storming. Yes, I believe Probably go to the beach. Imagining. I haven't been to the beach. I haven't been to the beach in two years. And so uh, it's probably, my guess would be seven days of rain. <laughs> Nevertheless, the power of negative thinking. What I now, Matt, are you going to be in town? I am. Now, Matt's going to be uh, around town, just hanging out, doing what he does, I lounging imagine. around Prospect Park, probably. Probably uh, staying up late. Uh, Ganja uh, Nixon tapes. That's what I was going to say. Hanging out, hanging out at Prospect Park in his me undies. Right? I hope so. That's your claim to fame. He said, I hope yes. so. Yep, it's my, it's my claim to fame. You can get arrested out Look, there. Regardless of what you're wearing, suit, sweatpants, you spend almost 24 hours a day in your underwear. So Matt could be hanging out at Prospect Park, or he could be at home listening to Nixon tapes, you know, I don't know, with an eight-foot bong. It doesn't matter. The fact is... He's got an amazing recoil, he's, fellas. He's doing his meandries. And the only reason why I give him credit for uh, wearing them as opposed to me is because the first time we talked about uh, modal, which is the fabric that meandries is made out of. Incredibly uh, comfortable. Revolutionary. Matt like, yeah, Matt was like, I was on to modal two years ago. 2011. Two th- <laughs> five years ago. And Van now, Gardist. finally, you're full on. You're full on me undies now, aren't you? Yep. Uh, every month, I get a new designer pair. He, so he's got a subscription program. For me, I just go and I buy like I'm going to buy like five pairs of underwear, and I'm going to buy new ones when they wear out. But I guess the subscription thing is more like I, I don't buy clothes in a normal fashion. I, uh, I'm aware of that. But nothing can describe the fit and feel of me undies. Once you try them on, you'll understand why they're called the world's most comfortable underwear. And if you don't love your first pair of MeUndies, they're free. No questions asked. They have dozens of styles. Matt can attest to that. Shipping is free in the U.S. and Canada. Me, I just get all black. I don't, I don't want different styles. I just want something that's simple. I don't want to look at my underwear drawer and have to decide, like, do I want that pattern or this pattern today? I don't want to think about it. That's why I only have two pairs of pants, too, because I don't want to. There's no debate for me. I just grab it and I put it on. Great. Shipping's free in the U.S. and Canada. You could save up to eight bucks a pair with the MeUndies subscription plan. That's the reason why I think one Matt probably does it. Get the, the subscription or single pair. Get 20% off your first order when you go to MeUndies.com slash majority. That's MeUndies.com slash majority for 20% off your first order. MeUndies.com slash majority. Do it now. So this is what we have this week on this program. Obviously, yesterday, Chris Lehman. On Monday, we had two dope boys. I hope people enjoyed the uh, money cult. Today, Baz Dressinger talks about prisons. And it was interesting because 
this came up in another conversation I had about private pr- uh, prisons that I spoke to David Dayan about. Did you know that, like, the prisons as we conceive of them has not been what prisons... We just assume, like, prisons have always been like prisons are. Mm-hmm. It is a relatively recent phenomenon, 150 yes. years, that started in two prisons, one in Pennsylvania, one in upstate New York. And then we exported it. Uh, all this came from Baz Dresinger, uh, and it is, uh, it's a fascinating conversation. And then tomorrow, Paul Tuff, uh, uh, an old friend of mine, I haven't been in touch with him in a long time, um, and, uh, but he, uh, I, uh, I talked to him on education. Some things I disagree with him a little bit about in terms of like, uh, the efficacy of, of charters, but he's written now three books about education and, and particularly like how children learn. And I think he's, he's, de- he's evolved over time. It's been fascinating because his books scanned over the course of all of the, um, the, the school reform debate. And then on Friday, you're not going to want to miss that. Dave Daly has written a book about how the Republicans came up with the whole scheme to uh, gerrymander districts in such a way that they can't lose and, and what we can do about it. So uh, this week we've got a lot of great content. And yet we're on vacation, ostensibly I am, and uh, it's probably raining, but that's uh, that's what makes this show special and you can become a member of this show by going to join the majority report.com and becoming a member uh, for just pennies a day and you know it's all commercial free when you're a member you just get the podcast but for those of you who are not uh members of the show look at my face i am not shaven I am on vacation now. Not good. I don't shave on vacation. But when I get back, I have to say that I have had no razor that deals with the fact that I don't shave for days at a time better than my Harry's. Some razors I've had, they're okay if you shave every day, but I rarely have been in any period of my life when I've done that. More often than not, I go three or four days without shaving, and then it's tough. Then it hurts. I don't know if it's because Harry's got... Um, five blades. I don't know if it's the quality of the blades, uh, but whatever it is, that is one of my favorite things about Harry's. That's why when I say, like, I've got the best shave I've gotten from Harry's, it's basically rated on the fact that I'm, I'm shaving with half a beard almost every time I shave. Harry's five blade razors include softer flex hinge for a more comfortable glide, trimmer blade for hard to reach places so that, you know, you're not like cutting off your nose to get your full mustache shaved. That happens. It's quite an image. Yeah. <laughs> Lubricating strip, which makes it feel smoother. Textured handle for control when it's wet. And it's still just $2 a blade compared to 4 bucks or more that you pay at the drugstore. Quality is always 100% guaranteed. If you don't love your shave, Harry's will fully refund you. And they send it to your door so you don't have to deal with... Walgreens, Walmart, Dwayne Greens, whatever the hell it is these days. The Harry Starter Set is an amazing deal. You get a weighted razor or handle of your choice, moisturizing shave cream, three precision engineered five-blade covered cartridges, and a travel cover. I don't even know why a travel cover. You never have to leave your house. They just keep sending you razors. All for just 15 bucks. And for a limited time only, there's a special offer for fans of the show where you can get it for less. We have partnered with Harry's to give you five bucks off your first purchase. If you've never tried Harry's, now's the time. Promo code Majority Report. Go to harrys.com right now. Enter the code Majority Report at checkout. Claim your offer. That's harrys.com, code Majority Report. All right, quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Baz Dresinger. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Baz Dreisinger. She's an associate professor of English at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. Also the uh, a founder of the Prison to College Pipeline Initiative at John Jay and author of Incarceration Nations, A Journey to Justice in Prisons Around the World. Uh, Boz, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. 
So uh, this was uh, this is sort of I, I mean uh, y- you went to um, about uh, I guess uh, over a half a dozen countries. Um, give me a sense of of what inspired you to do this sort of comparative analysis. Well, I was I was really interested in number one putting a global perspective on an issue that is heavily, you know, thankfully heavily being addressed here in the States, and that's the issue of mass incarceration. I felt like there there is now um, a lot of conversation around America's crisis of mass incarceration with our 2.3 million people incarcerated with 25% of the world's prison population. So there's increasingly uh, intense discussion about that. But I felt like there was something missing in terms of a global perspective on this, the rest of the world's crisis and the way that we as uh, with this American system have foisted it upon the rest of the world in all kinds of ways. And then I was also interested in using that to step back and really think hard about the philosophical basis of our criminal justice system and our prison system and really using this journey through countries prison systems to rethink what we're doing when we respond to crime with prison altogether and so so that's what I did visiting nine different countries around the world and uh, let's just talk for a moment about the the is there a distinction between uh the the, the criminal justice system and the penal system i mean is there uh, how are the i mean obviously i mean it there, there's an obvious answer as to how they're connected, but are 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 we? Um, is it typical that the problem is on both ends, sort of both? So, uh, go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, no, that's a great question um, because I think people just conflate the two automatically, and there is a difference. I mean, cr- the criminal justice system is how we pursue justice, how we deal with um, promote promoting community safety, uh, how we respond to crime when it happens and how we address wrongdoing in communities and maintain community order, right? That's what the community just, com, com, criminal justice system is about. Um, and we have typically the response for the past couple hundred years, both in America and, again, sort of thanks to our exportation around the world, has been to respond with a penal system. But that is not the only way to, to, to dole out justice historically, nor does it have to be. So I think it's important to distinguish. We need to recognize that the penal system as it stands is the modern penal system is a relatively recent invention being a couple hundred years old. But there are other ways to conceive of what justice might look like, other ways to talk about keeping communities safe and um, and, and dealing with those who violate wrongs within communities. Uh, talk about that, uh, the, the penal system as a relatively speaking um uh, new development. I mean, I think that, you know, people have this notion of like, well, there's always been dungeons in some way uh, or something to that effect. I mean, it, it, talk about it in terms of of uh, its historical development. Um, and then I'd like to talk about whether or not there can be a penal system that is a, a different type of penal system. Uh, but 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 talk about that as a as a um, as a relatively historically speaking new phenomena. Sure. So there have always been dungeons. There have always been um, holding cells for those who who violate community norms and and commit heinous wrongdoings. But for the most part, uh, prior to the 19th century, these were used as temporary holding cells while the community came together to figure out a course of justice for someone. And sometimes, I'm not saying this was always enormously humane, right? Sometimes it was banishment. Sometimes it was uh, corporal punishment, physical punishment. Um, but the response, it was really seeing prison more as this temporary space. Now, what happened in the late 18th century was that there started to be these ideas circulated around Europe about the possibility of creating prison as a response to crime in lieu of corporal punishment and other kinds of punishment. And so there, was, there were all these philosophers in France, in England, envisioning what this thing that is now called the modern prison system might look like. And they even had physical designs that resemble really the physical architecture of our prisons. Now, in the U.S. in the early 19th century, as we're coming into uh, our nationhood, America decided as a progressive nation or wanted to place itself as being a progressive nation to enact these European ideas and thus built 
the first modern prison, two models that are seen as the first modern prisons. And one is Auburn in New York and one is Eastern in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. And so these became the models on which many global prisons were based, uh, many American prisons were based. And what happened was that prison became something that instead of being a temporary response to crime became the one exclusive response to crime. You commit a wrongdoing, you must be locked up in prison um, and your sentence, you know, your wrongdoing is measured in your sentence and the length of your sentence. And, and, and so, I mean, uh, the, uh, so prison was sort of, was, I guess, the, the attempt to be more evolved, right? I mean, yes. and, and, and more yes. civilized. I mean, how did, like, was there actuarial tables? Like, well, we give, um, uh, uh, 10 lashings for this uh, crime or we put them in the stockade for four days uh, or uh, we, I guess, presumably, I don't know, drown them, uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, for, for, for this. I mean, how did that, how was that determination made? Like, all right, let's instead, we'll put a timeline on this because what, was it like, this is how long it would take your, your back to heal or, you know, or, or what was it? In many respects, it was. I mean, we have to remember it was that the, the ideas around prison were born during the Age of Reason, during the Enlightenment. So there was an attachment to this idea of doing things cleanly and in a quote-unquote civilized, calculated, mathematical fashion. So there was an appeal to this idea that sentences could be done, you know, could be generated in an almost mathematical fashion. You do this wrong, that equals X amount of years. But as it was enacted in America, it was also influenced by religious ideas. Uh, Eastern Penitentiary, which is the, the prison on which the most prisons around the world are based, was modeled after a penitence, penitentiary, a monastery. And so the idea being you, you take a Bible, you read the Bible, and that will allow you to repent and so the amount of time that you were sentenced was considered, that's the amount of time that it's going to take you to repent from your crime, to engage in penitence in the penitentiary, and then be corrected. And, of course, we know it doesn't work that way. You don't put someone in a cell with a Bible, and then there's a miraculous turnaround. So it's sort of uh, like the same uh, calculation. I guess you go in for confession, right? You, and you got to uh, say five yep. Hail Marys as opposed to ten Hail Marys. And they just exactly they Great just made comparison. that temporal. Yeah. Well, so what was happening in the non it, 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 you know outside of Europe in the non Western world w was was prisons developing or not developing or was punishment more or less uh, in similar fashion or did uh, did and much of that not develop until after uh, the United States created this model? So as much as we can generalize, because of course you know it's the world, it's big, but. Um, as much as we can generalize, much of the non-Western world was using restorative justice approaches, community justice, where it was about uh, wrongdoing and restitution and reparations for those wrongdoings. So you had certainly in many um, regions in Africa, you had restorative justice happening. Um, in Asia, you certainly had corporal punishment and, and physical punishment. Banishment was a, was a major form. In fact, I mean, the U.S. in many ways was born of that. And Australia, prison, prison colony, there were prison colonies all over the world. So there were all kinds of other means of, of addressing crime and producing justice. And then what happened after America built these modern prisons in the early 19th century was that you had leaders from all over the world, uh, particularly the colonial leaders coming out to look at this model and then take it back with them. And that is how the model ultimately became replicated. And, and of course, I would imagine by that time, too, the idea of banishment becomes uh, a little bit more difficult because you don't yes. have places that are as remote as they used to be. Yes, absolutely. And um, and then by the time you had, you know, you started the process of decolonization, it became even more difficult. Uh, America's independence actually is part of what, what spawned Australia's birth because we were no longer a dumping ground for, um, you know, for those who were considered unworthy. And so they had to find new spaces to, to, to banish people to. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know if if people are aware that Australia. I mean, basically, you, is, was started as a penal colony, and uh, that that um, basically because they were just basically dropped off there, and good luck. Uh, mm -hmm. And 
Exactly. I mean, I actually write about Australia in my book, and I think the penal colony history is fascinating because people don't realize how many countries around the world were penal colonies at one point, and also how easy it was to be banished to one of these penal colonies, that it wasn't what we would call today the quote-unquote worst of the worst necessarily. You could, you could earn banishment for stealing a loaf of bread and for essentially being poor during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, what's old is new again in many respects, and maybe we can get mm-hmm. uh, get to that in a bit. But let's talk about the countries that you, you did visit. Uh, Rwanda, South Africa, Brazil, Jamaica, Uganda, Singapore, uh, Norway and Australia. Uh, why w- did you sit down and say, these are the countries I want to uh, visit? Uh, or um, did that develop over time? I mean, why those countries? So some I had in mind from the get-go, um, for instance, Rwanda and South Africa, because they start the book, those two countries. And um, in each chapter, what I wanted to do was focus on a particular theme, a sort of philosophical theme around prisons and around justice. And so I tried to choose a country that was somehow manifested that theme and would allow me to explore it. So Rwanda and South Africa, I knew from the get-go because I wanted to focus on this concept of forgiveness and restitution and reparations and restorative justice. And I'm not sure there are any two countries in the world that most embody that, both on an individual level in the justice system and on a national level. These are two countries that suffered major traumas and then in one form or another had truth and reconciliation commissions and engaged in reparations. And so I chose them to start the book. So I would start by thinking about those foundational concepts in justice. And then the other ones, I before um, let- some of them... I'm sorry. Let's before we move on to the other ones. Let's let's stay uh, with those two countries for a moment. Uh, 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 restore of justice. Will, will you explain that concept to, to people? I mean, I know that we've had guests on who have talked about it in the past, but it's been a while. Sure. So it's in a nutshell, it's a victim centered approach to justice as opposed to a quote unquote offender centered approach. And so instead, it's less about who did this and how is this? How can we punish this person? but rather looking at who was harmed and how can we make amends to that person who was harmed. So it's a very community-centered approach to justice, and it's radically different from the paradigm of punishment, which is what mass incarceration thrives on. And was um, uh, restorative justice a... um did that exist as a an ongoing, uh, not just concept, but practice in Rwanda and South Africa before it became more adopted as a sort of societal-wide problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was, because, I mean, Rwanda in particular, after the genocide, had very famously had these gachacha courts, which were massive tribunals during which uh, forms of restitution were determined between victims and offenders. And, and they always said, they being the Rwandan sort of the Rwandan collective, that this wasn't some new thing. This was a return to the original form of community justice that many of the ethnic groups practiced in Rwanda at the time. And this is true about Africa more generally. Many of the communities and ethnic groups practiced restorative justice before the colonial system of prisons and punishment was imposed on them. So for Rwanda in particular, there's a lot of talk about the gachacha was a return to the justice that we know as opposed to the justice that um, the, the Belgian and the French colonials imposed upon us. What, what does it say about, I guess, the concept of just, I mean, the philosophical concept, the underpinnings and the value system of, of, of I guess, adopting or not even adopting of of having that uh, a restorative justice um, program organically exist versus a punitive one. I mean, is there something well, in think... society about the way that people is, is it? I mean, is is Christianity or uh, Judeo Christian uh, um, uh, values? Is that the the sort of the fundamental difference? Well, to some extent, I mean, I think the Bible, and I think it's a very complicated topic, I think the Bible can be read both restoratively and punitively, and both when you're talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament. I think there are elements in the Bible to support both systems of justice, um, but 
I think overall, I mean, I certainly am an avid fan of restorative justice as a paradigm. And, and that's because I don't think the criminal justice system as it stands, and I've, I've seen it uh, around the world, serves victims well. And a restorative approach is much more about serving victims as needs. And I think, too, a system of punishment, to me, punishment is inherently immoral. Uh, the idea that you harm someone because they have done harm is really a basic hypocrisy to me. Now, corrections is something different. Repair, restoration, um, reparations, making amends, uh, which, is, which are all bigger and deeper than simply forgiveness. Forgiveness is a personal act. But those other things, to me, are far more um, morally acceptable and exciting than talking about punishment. So to me, and, and it's very much at the heart of, of my book and all the work that I do, a restorative approach is serving victims better and is inherently more moral. I mean, but is there something uh, with the the demographics of these places uh, versus ours that, um, that, that lends itself to... To, to come to this type of system? I mean, because it just occurs to me that, like, well, uh, I mean, in, in this country, we were very much founded on the idea of us and this other that we've either um, brought here on slave ships or found here when we got here. And, mm-hmm. um, it, you know, um, that immediately sets up this sort of two-tiered moral um, uh, universe, right? Where it's like good people and bad people. And we have basic, you know, uh, we have basic, you know, sometimes people switch uh, uniforms um, uh, more or less, but that's basically how it breaks down. And it becomes, it seems to me, much easier to have that uh, perspective of some people need to be punished. Uh, Yes. I, I like that reading a lot. I think I would add to it mean two things. One, I would add that there has always been a very serious Old Testament strain to the Christianity in America from our founding, from the Puritan founding. And so um, there's a certain kind of Old Testament eye for an eye um, approach that, that produces the imperative to punishment in this country. And the other thing that I, that I think produces that imperative toward punishment over and above certain other societies perhaps is capitalism. I mean, America was founded as a capitalist nation. It's, it's our ethos. It's all about the I, the self, the individual, um, individual agency. And I think capitalism is inherently tied into, again, this idea of us versus them and punishment. And if you can't um, sort of exist in the world the way that I do, then you're an other. And so capitalism produces inequality and inequality produces crime and also produces the need to punish. The most equal societies in the world, I visited Norway for my book, and that's a very equal society in all kinds of ways of wealth distribution. It's not fundamentally capitalist in its ethos the way that we are. And so its approach to justice is quite different as a result of that. Is that also a function of the, uh, does that tie into the sort of the notion of, 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 of how property is viewed? Because, I mean, as we, we talk about, um, you know, some of the earliest sort of I- imprisonments and banishments, um, more often than not, it really has to do with with property, right? Like uh, poor people stealing food or, you know, or uh, the flip side of that being like, well, uh, there's a whole set of crimes that uh, we would now perceive as a crime. But 200 years ago, we wouldn't because uh, those people are, you know, the perpetrators perpetrating them on, you know, a person that is basically their property. Um, Mm. I mean, does, does the perspective on property also play into that or is that, is that redundant with the idea of capitalism? Well, I think it goes hand in hand with the idea of capitalism, right? The, The importance of property above all, the importance of individual rights over and above thinking about individual as opposed to community, um, and being disinclined to think about individuals as being shaped by their circumstances, as opposed to individual, the American dream is, is built on the idea of free agency and free will, that every choice you make, so if you choose to steal, you are inherently you know, immoral and worthy of punishment. Whereas when you think in a more communitarian fashion, then you recognize that people are products of their communities and that we are all in this together and that 
you know, to cut to, to punish you in a way that's going to harm the community is also to harm me. It's just a radically different way of thinking that does all come back to capitalism. And also, I think the idea of property is interesting in terms of human beings as um, physical property, who a property of the state who can be taken away from their communities if they violate some, some idea of a social contract and then thrust into these prisons. Uh, Lastly, and I, and I do want to move on to the other countries, but but um, d- does how does the existence of of civil claims implicate this? So, so for instance, like you know, in this country, um, we we perceive uh, property uh, in many respects uh, to be, or at least there's at least a strain in our uh, our DNA that perceives property as sacrosanct, and while the criminal justice doesn't necessarily deal with uh, restoring that. Uh, theoretically, the civil uh, civil uh, procedure does right. Like I, um, I, I, I sue you. Of, I mean, I, you know, you go to jail for 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 killing uh, my uh, my my brother, uh, but then I'll also sue you for damages too if I think that you can. Um, uh, or, uh, you know, if I can get money out of you uh, for, for a wrongful death or something like that. I mean, does, is the, mm-hmm. d- does the absence, I mean, in those countries where there's restorative justice, uh, is there torts in the same way that we perceive them here? Well, there are. I mean, it doesn't, um, the, the, much of what I was writing about in terms of restorative justice were sort of grand experiments in it and elements of it that are infused into the system. So the distinction between the criminal law and the civil law might still exist in these places, absolutely. But if you ask me, I don't think they should. I think that the very, that very division speaks to the fact that we are not operating restoratively. Because if we're operating restoratively, then it's not about some crime against, theoretically against the state, right? Um, it's about a crime against an individual. And community courts and, and systems of restitution should be coordinated between those two parties. Um, and I've not seen anything that so radically does that necessarily. Um, Rwanda, after the Gachacha courts, did operate that way. Uh, there were some people who were prosecuted for particular crimes against humanity, but in other scenarios, it was very much operating as what we would say a civil case. And to me, that, that simply makes a lot more sense. Um, so tell us about the other countries that y- you visited, uh, Brazil, Jamaica, Uganda, Singapore, Australia. We've, we've, we've touched on Norway a little bit. So I went to, uh, I, I started in Rwanda and then went to South Africa. Um, I spent time in Uganda and Jamaica looking at the role of the arts in prisons, at, at specifically at creative writing and music and thinking about how these can be used in really sort of dire situations in prisons as agencies of healing and, and of this thing that we actually call corrections and rehabilitation and so on. And uh, from there, I went to Thailand to look at women, the crisis of female incarceration, the largest, the fastest rising prison population in the U.S. and in pretty much globally. And uh, I looked at Thailand as a very, very high female uh, incarceration rate, but specifically to work with the princess of Thailand, who's quite invested in the issue and has set up an NGO around it, around creating these model prisons for women. And in many ways, the scenario for women in, in Thai prisons is reflective of the global crisis, which is that women are, for the most part, co-defendants. Co-de- usually involving husbands and boyfriends, usually involving drugs and addiction, um, and usually not aware of of the extent of the law before they violate it. Um, So I went to Thailand to work in the Princess's Initiative. Is that what's driving it in Thailand and and in this country is... is... Oh, yes. Yes, very much. I mean, the statistics show, the statistics range, but they generally show that women are in for, for some for the most part, drug crimes that usually involve a partner of some kind. And in Thailand in particular, the women are kind of the foot soldiers in the drug, in the drug trade, as opposed to the kingpins, who are generally men. And the women are very also in a very vulnerable position, uh, given that culturally they're sort of expected to do what a man asks them to do. And so that's, those were the stories that I heard again and again from women in Thai prisons. 
Well, how, I mean, what what accounts for that change? I mean, was there a point where just um, drug runners said, "You know what? I'm I've got an underutilized resource that is the the women around me." I mean, what 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 accounts for that change? Well, I mean, it's hard to say, and I don't have the definitive answer for that. You know, to know exactly when that shift occurred, but I can say that it's about. I don't know that it was never not that way per se, but it was more about the crackdown on mm. the drug trade that happened as a result of the war on drugs. So that you're seeing more and more people caught up in this net and in a kind of frenzy. I mean, the Thai government ter- turned um, transformed its drug laws overnight, creating much harsher sentences in the early 2000s that it skyrocketed the prison population. And so that and they just went on this kind of rampage, really, to collect anyone involved in the drug trade in any capacity. We're actually seeing something really similar in, in the Philippines right now with the new president who's cracking down. Now, you know, an illegal drug trade is, is an issue, but the, the approach of just coming down hard and collecting everybody and incarcerating them tends to harm the hapless foot soldiers the most because they are the most vulnerable, they're the easiest to get, and they're not the source of the problem, right? So um, it's, and I think it's a product of the global war on drugs, which again is to a great extent an exportation from the U.S., from our war on drugs and our putting intense pressure on various countries to crack down in exactly that way. And cracking down does not mean smart on crime. It means tough on crime and it means collecting a lot of women who end up in prisons. I, I get how uh, the United States uh, exports uh, the, the things like the drug law, right? Because that uh, sort of, um, we need their uh, their capitulation theoretically to execute our policy. What was it about our prison set system that became so attractive or, uh, to the rest of the world? Well, initially, it was seen as uh, it, it was seen as remarkably civilized, as we were talking about, right? It was this alternative. It was seen as a very clean, progressive way of dealing with crime, almost like I mean, it was developed again during the Industrial Revolution, during the, the Enlightenment. So it was it was almost like a factory for human beings, and that approach, that capitalistic approach, thinking about human beings as castle, basically, who can be fixed in these factories and then return to the workforce um, was very appealing as all of these nations were were industrializing. Um, and to the colonial forces in particular, who then foisted it upon their colonies as a show of law and order. It also fit in very well in many places, Uganda, for instance, uh, as a further reinforcement of racial hierarchies and further enforcement of oppressive regimes that kept the natives under control. Here was a very orderly way of doing that. Um, so it was appealing then. And then as, as the years go on, I mean, I, I get into the history of prisons as, uh, in the modern day scene. And there were other American inventions that then made their way overseas because by that point it was seen as, well, America seems to have figured this out. We seem to have figured out justice and we've figured out society and we've figured out capitalism. So the natural American copycatting tactic of copying our approach to private prisons, copying our supermaxes. Both of those are American inventions that the rest of the world then took to as well. I wanted to talk about that supermax. Um, the, uh, that is what, I guess, um, Brazil uh, became. Uh, you, you, your, your trip to Brazil was, um, I, I guess, uh, the, the idea of solitary confinement and, and supermax prisons. Um, was represented by Brazil. Just tell us about about uh, that. Uh, you know what uh, what we learned from from what's happening in Brazil in that regard. So Brazil is is one of at least a dozen countries that has adopted this supermax model. This idea of of sticking what is considered quote unquote the worst of the worst in cells for up to 23 hours a day with basically no programming, solitary confinement for years and years, and extreme control over these uh, particularly incarcerated people. And Brazil just built five very expensive supermax prisons that are holding a couple hundred people each, uh, presumably to control gang violence in the prisons, 
And what I saw when I went there, I actually went to the first one that opened in Casanduvas in the south of Brazil, is a, an absolute horror show. It's people, which is what we know happens in solitary confinement. You go mad and you are further damaged and return to society even more um, destructive and damage, capable of damage than you were to begin with. And so I spoke with people from very, very extreme circumstances of poverty and racism and inequality, products of all of those things, products of the favelas in Brazil, the ghettos in Brazil, who were locked up in this supermax and costing the government uh, unbelievable amounts of money, uh, at least 100000 a year per, uh, per prisoner to be housed in one of these supermaxes in a country that, as we well know, especially lately with the Olympics, um, we know that this is not a country that has that kind of money to waste. So um, at the end of of this, I mean, what um, did you... <laughs> Uh, wh- where are we uh, in this regard? And, and, and I guess in terms of, of did this cause optimism insofar as like you saw some examples of, of, of viable options or uh, what, uh, where did it leave you after this journey? Well, I, I am a kind of incurable optimist. I'm always looking for hope and possibility. And I think doing this work, uh, which, which I do every day, you have to maintain that and you have to think about not only what is and what has been, but what could be. And so a big theme of the book, as you mentioned, was that everywhere I went, I think Brazil might be the one exception where I didn't really find something redeeming, something valuable, something that can be learned from and perhaps adopted when we think about our justice system. And I end the book in Norway where I visit two very famous prisons. One is what's called an open prison, which is a Scandinavian model that's used also in some other countries in Europe. And that's the, an idea whereby people incarcerated can come and go, maintain connections to communities, come back to the prison at night, but still have weekend leave for families, hold jobs outside. Um, and it's a very inspirational model for sure, that is not used in this country at all, or, or if, if at all in terms of work release, but barely at all. Um, and then I think there are other, the, the, some of what I saw in Thailand, some of what I saw in terms of the role of what the arts can do, certainly what I saw in Rwanda in terms of restorative justice and what people are capable of when it comes to promoting reparations over revenge. Um, there's bits and pieces to pull from that would allow us to rethink this whole paradigm. But I think the key is, I don't have all the answers. That I know. I'm not sure anybody does. But the key is to recognize that, number one, something has to change. We cannot exist as we are. And number two, prison as an institution in and of itself is pretty inherently immoral. And there are other ways of promoting justice. This is, it's enormously lazy to think of prison as the only response to crime. Um, and people will always say, well, what about the mass murderer and the, the, the mass rapist? And my response to that is that is the very, very, very small percentage of what is being locked up both here and around the world. And yes, there are some people who in some capacity will cause great harm if they are free in society, but that is not the, not the bulk of our prison system. And so it's incumbent upon us to kind of use our imaginations and pursue justice in creative ways and think outside the box and not use this lazy, um, archaic approach to justice overall. Do you, do you think in this country that we're even remotely close? I mean, there is, a, a, you know, on one hand, I feel like, you know, uh, criminal justice reform, uh, in one shape or another, is one of the few things that you can actually see some bipartisan work on, uh, mm-hmm. somewhat legislatively, but, you know, to a certain extent, but also in terms of, like, think tanks and stuff like that. And then on the other hand, I think about, like, the the American psyche, where the concept of the, the concept um, of of not locking people up and throwing away the key, you know, you just I, I just. The idea of of conservatives talking about uh, uh, Guantanamo Bay is Club Gitmo, right? And the idea, like, I could just mm-hmm. imagine what the uh, at least a a large part of uh, the American public, I mean, right and left, would say about like a prison where people, you know, are learning things and 
the mm-hmm. prison set up to be close to the family type of thing. Like why, you know, that it, it feels like we would need such a massive sea change in the, uh, uh, something far more basic to get anywhere close to that in this country. I, 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 I agree. And I think, but I think it's possible. I think the public consciousness has to shift around this issue. There are things that we take for granted. And I think about this a lot because first and foremost, I'm an educator. And what I try to do in my classroom, wherever that classroom is, is just get people to question their assumptions. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to take my assumptions as yours. But if you're taking all of these assumptions for granted around an issue as important as justice and human lives, um, then there's a big problem. And so I think a big part of the work that has to be done is getting people to shift their consciousness, getting people to rethink their assumptions and their premises around justice and around what it can look like. And I think that's work that's being done. I know that there are, I'm generally in the work that I do with the Prison to College Pipeline and through the book, Um, I'm connected with so many incredible people who are enacting change and thinking brilliantly around this issue. The Vera Institute of Justice has a reimagining prisons initiative that's really exciting, and it's about exactly what I was saying earlier, envisioning what could be instead of only talking about what is and painting a picture of what could be. But the work that has to be done on many levels is the work of convincing people to think differently or to at least question their assumptions. And that's why I wrote the book over and over and above anything. I wrote it as a book that I wanted to be readable by, by a general public who's interested in this, doesn't have to have a whole lot of background about it, but wants to think about it and take this journey with me and, and question some of what you hold dear. And if you don't agree with me, that's fine, but at least the conversation is happening. I mean, I, I couldn't do the work on a daily basis if I didn't think that change was possible. Boz Dreisinger, founding academic director of Prison to College Pipeline at the uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice and author of Incarceration Nations, A Journey to Justice in Prisons Around the World. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. But finding out won't make me feel any better. Yeah, I know. Yeah.